is that if all things are predetermined by God, how are humans morally responsible for the rejection of the gospel? And instead of just answering the question, what he did is he went on Veckel's channel and went on a two-hour tirade of saying all sorts of stuff that I don't even agree with most of it, uh, slandering and stuff, and uh, none of them answered the question. So go ahead, John. Let's hear you answer it. Well, uh, I won't get into that, but with respect to the issue of determinism, how can we be free and morally responsible, it is your it is the question of compatibilism. Do you affirm compatibilism? A compatibilist would say that those are conceptually compatible ideas. And so the compatibilist is just going to say, where's the contradiction? You would have to give independent reasons why there's internal conflict between those two things. Okay. We would I'll just say we don't see a contradiction. <clears throat> Did God determine in eternity past that there will be individuals that reject the gospel? Absolutely. Right, so how are they morally responsible for rejecting the gospel? That's, well, I'm the one who doesn't think they're in contradiction. You are. So you no, have I'm the burden to prove you, that. No, no, don't, don't try to shift the burden. I'm asking you. If God's determined you, you don't realize that there will be individuals that reject the gospel, how are they responsible for rejecting the gospel? My position is a negative position. Your position is a positive one. You're the one making the positive assertion. You're not answering the question. Oh goodness, Kevin. <laughs> again, this is Kevin, why we didn't. Get, this is why we didn't get anywhere on your live stream, brother. Because yeah, you because you not... dance around issues. You don't answer questions. <laughs> You're not clear with your language. You love to live in the realm of confusion. <laughs> well, praise. Uh, let me answer you this way. Compatibilism is simply the thesis that uh, we don't see a contradiction between. The concept of determinism and the concept of freedom and moral responsibility. How? You have to explain so that. You can't just assert it. How? Oh, goodness. It, look, if you don't want me to finish my sentence, then, you know, whatever. No, but I just want to I'm trying to answer praise. Have to respect me. for praise and let me answer his oh, question. Oh, me, look how you God. guys didn't respect me the other night. Oh, my goodness, Kevin. No, I'm mad. Dude, it's not fair. You're a hypocrite. <laughs> you demand right. people treat you differently than you treat others. <laughs> Uh, and, John, and I I, I, John, I, John, John, I don't even like Kevin, but I think he's asking you a valid question. You can't just assert things. He's asking you to to break it down. So I mean, well, I, I I'm more than willing to get into so. those things, but I'm just simply saying, like with respect to Praise's question, I want to actually give him the answer to his question. Is that okay, fair? Are you gonna break it down afterwards for Kevin? Sure. All right, let's go ahead. <laughs> So the, the issue with the compatibilism issue, it's a conceptual thesis. And so we're simply saying we don't see a contradiction. And so we're looking for the incompatibilist to give us a reason why they're internally contradictory. Because we just don't see a contradiction. Why would we say that there's a contradiction unless one is actually presented? Well, I think the, the issue we brought up in the uh, presentation is the there is no sourcehood. For there to be moral responsibility, you would have to have a control condition that shows sourcehood. And mm -hmm. that's just, it can't be true. Like, God is the source of his, his own choices, and he's morally free. Would you agree that God is morally free? Yes. So... If we are made in his image, it would follow that we also are the source of our own decisions and the well, move of our own. That, that would be where I would disagree. I do believe we have sourcehood. I just don't <laughs> oh, believe. <sighs> okay, can I answer the question? Okay, thank you. Sorry, I thought I was muted. <sighs> but I do believe we have sourcehood. I just don't think sourcehood entails incompatibilism. There are models of uh, sourcehood that are compatibilistic. Okay. And that's something that's that's laid out within, uh, especially Colton Car Carlson's work. He's done a lot of really good work in this area. Oh, I'm glad you brought him up. I watched your interview you had with him, John. And um, at the very beginning of the interview, he explained that there's two definitions of compatibilism. The classic right. definition of compatibilism is the assertion that determinism is true but humans are still morally responsible. And then there's the new 
definition or a redefinition, which modern Calvinists hold to. And I didn't know this, and this is where the confusion comes in, because again, you guys aren't clear with your pagan philosophy and words of men. And so, John, so from your framework, how you understand it, how how would you explain how humans are morally responsible for rejecting the gospel, even though God determined that that's what they would do? Can you explain that to me? Keep in mind, you have to account for uh, uh, predeterminism on, on top of that. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, that's a great question. Can you ask it one more time? Um, a little louder for the people in the back. And John, please just try to give us a, a straight answer, man. Please, John, Kevin, one, can you say that one more time, please? That was a great question. All right, well, John, did you hear the question? Do you need me to repeat it? Go ahead, I, I need it repeated, please, Kevin. All right, all right. Um, <clears throat> So from your framework, John, no, no, not every Calvinist, not James White, not Westminster, not the Council of Dort, not the Council of Or. I'm just specifically asking you, John Myers, from your framework, how you understand things, how do you give an account? How are human beings responsible for rejecting the gospel if God had determined that that's what they would do? Well, that's because I don't believe there is a contradiction between those two concepts. And this John, God, this God. If, I don't, if I don't think there's a contradiction between determinism and free will and, and moral responsibility, then uh, I'm not entitled to explain why there's contradictions. Yeah, yes, you are, because if you're assuming... Hold on, the burden, John, I, if I deny... Entitled you obligated, I I'm not obligated to obligated. explain why there's contradictions in my view. If I don't think there are any, do you see the problem but with that? John, you can't do that. Would be like just me asserting something, and then when you press me on it, I say, "Well, I don't have to explain it." That's that's all you've You're, done. You haven't explained it. And that is, yeah, that is exactly correct. You put these like undefined, undetermined like platitudes out there without any real defined boundary lines, and you just assert that that's the way it is, and you don't give anything. Source material wise. I never, I oh, never, you oh, so, so let me let me try let me try again, John. So I, and, I never said. Yeah. By the way, guys, I never said compatibilism is true here. I'm just simply okay. coming from What's the compatibilism standpoint. Price of tea in China, dude. John, so here uh, again. So if God already determined that I would reject the gospel, then why am I morally responsible for eternity in hell? If, because you're a sinner. If, everyone's a determined sinner. Everyone's a sinner, and ever that's why everyone is is would be rightfully sent to hell. Well, John, we don't disagree, but you're with all due respect, you're not addressing the, the issue. I'm not seeing an issue because my view don't and doesn't okay. think that there is a contradiction between those things. If God has determined question, See, or, um, see, guys, you have to realize when you ask the question, if God has determined, yeah. then how could we be morally responsible? You're just flatly assuming incompatibilism. No, I'm, I'm genuinely asking you a no. question. I want you no, to explain that, That's what that means. Worldview, that so that just understand. is an incompatibilistic question because you think those, just, in, those just entail contradictions. That's an incompatibilistic question. No. Okay, John, if I ask you to produce a report, right, but you don't agree with something on the report, are you going to leave it off and expect to get a raise? Does does that make sense? What does that question have to do with the issue? The issue is that you're, you're refusing to acknowledge a contradiction that people keep putting into your face, right? It's only a contradiction if you think incompatibilism is true, that those are mutually exclusive concepts. You guys don't seem to in realize that. Mind, that's bro. Question, the only place where that applies is in that little space you call your mind. But the John, tiny hang on, area. Made, hang on a second, Dustin. If I'm, let's say I, I am a genius. I made a robot, and I, and I programmed. I can make this robot do whatever I want. I could even... Make it believe it has the. I already explained choice. to you why this doesn't work uh, on your hey, John, life. If you're gonna ask, if you're gonna ask not to be interrupted, don't interrupt Kevin. Let him let him get his his analogy across before you start saying anything. My, Kevin, my point is, is if I've predetermined 
what my creation is going to do, in, in the case of me, because I'm only human, would be a robot, then the robot, how could I justly hold it responsible for its rejection of me or, or what it's done when that's what I have programmed or determined for it to do? You can't just ad hoc blame something for something that you've caused it or determined it to do. That is not a just thing. So if it is true... Why? Be, because that's not just. Why? Because it's not. See, our court because, see, 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 wait, guys, hold on. Did you guys catch that? Wait. Everyone stop. Oh. Everyone stop. Everyone stop. Yeah. Did you guys hear what just happened? When I asked why is it unjust, he says, because it's not just. Because it's not just. That's not an answer to my question. John, so if, I forced you, just just if I force you force you into a machine that ho that forces you to hold a gun to your head and pulls the trigger, am I responsible or are you responsible? Which one is it? And again, that's not the compatibilistic model. No, that, that it, has nothing to do. Answer the stupid it's question. Answer the question, question John. Uh, all right, hold on, Dustin, relax. All right, guys. Um, and like, uh, really? The, the yeah. thing is, so, okay, <clears throat> so let's pretend we're not arguing for determinism or any of that stuff. I'm just asking you from your view, how do these things work together? That's all I want to know. Sure. That's what I'm asking you is how, how, is, how is God um off the hook here like how is the human responsible for his rejection of god well i would say because within god's determination god has determined for us to actually make those choices in his, in his own creation and that be, we would be hold morally responsible for actions within his creation that god has actually decreed for us to have that type of volition that is morally responsible that's just part of what God has determined. Okay. But again, how is that just, though? See, uh, Kevin, this is this is my problem. On within my framework, I just don't see an issue. You're the one having the issue, so you're the one that has to present the critique, not me. We're presenting the critique. You're ignoring the parameters. Hey, guys, you're pretending like they don't apply to anything. When I asked why is it unjust for God to determine someone to go to hell and then, you know, them to go to hell and, and all those things, why is that unjust? Okay. I'll, the answer, answer is the answer because is because unjust. God is holy, and holy means to be separated from sin. And if God is the one that's determined all of our sinful actions and intents, then he is not separate from sin, and therefore he is not holy, and therefore he would not be I just. I dispute that premise. I dispute that God uh, would... Uh, it, God would not be separate from sin. What are you putting in its place, John? If you're disputing the premise, what are you putting in its place? What I'm saying is I don't agree with the critique and see the, oh, the way that he was framed. John, what are you putting in its place? Oh my goodness, Kevin was presenting an internal critique, and I appreciate him for it because he's actually trying. Dustin, you're doing nothing but just going ask legitimate oh. questions that you're not answering. Dustin, Dustin let, is trying to get let, a straight answer. Let, out of let me so. answer. I'm trying to get a straight answer hey, out of you. Let bro. me answer you're, the question. You're dancing around the question. Oh just goodness. answer the question. I'm getting to it. Sheesh. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't have all night. Answer the damn question. <laughs> but with respect to to Kevin's critique, he was he was saying, well, God has to for God to be holy, he has to be separate from sin, which I agree. And he says, if God determines whatsoever comes to pass, then he is not separate from sin. I don't agree well, with that. More statement. specifically, I said, if God is not only determining the sin, but he's also determining the sinful intentions so that they come to be, he cannot be holy. So so if, if so that's wait, not the critique, the inference, if that the does not fit, what fits in that portion of the of the, the, the critique then? What are you putting in its place? You're saying that it doesn't belong it there. It doesn't belong there because I don't agree with that premise, meaning that yeah. critique doesn't follow. I understand that, John. You've I made the answer in its place because it's not what my I'm criticism, Dustin. What are you putting you in know, its place? Do you if know how debate works, Dustin? That's not how that works. And you're saying you I don't, don't have you to. Know that, shut it's up, not my, John. It's not my argument, Dustin. 
just listen <laughs> for a second, John. Listen to my question so that you understand the premise. Okay? If you're saying that something doesn't belong in a critique because you have a greater understanding of the critique, you need to no, put something in it. place or you no. need to or, shut up and listen. Or you need to highlight the underpinning issues for why the critique is in, irrelevant in the first place. You don't just say, I don't believe X, Y, Z, therefore A, B, C is invalid. Those yes, things, they're, it's they're perfectly mutually valid to each other. Let you, me answer you. You already brought it out. Let me explain. An internal critique is something that's dependent upon the other person you're critiquing believing the premises. The premises. Those premises are part of the other view. And what you're saying is, if those premises are true, this logically follows. And that's bad, so we should reject it. That's well, what John, an internal critique is That is classic doing. Calvinism. John Calvin himself even said that God moves on the hearts of men to do whatever he wills. Right. Yeah, and I agree. But Okay. The, so if the, God has moved being, on the hearts of men to do sin, how is he holy? Because I don't believe that means that God is not separate from sin. See, I, I don't agree with the premise that you introduced in that. Okay, critique, but how would you? That um, God is in fact. So if God, if sin. God is moving on the hearts of men to do, I don't know, let's say rape, for example. Um, can you explain then how, from your viewpoint, if God is doing that, how is he separate from the rape? Can you explain because that? Because God's not raping. But would the person have raped if God did not move on his heart to do so? Uh, well, we could make a strong case that he would have, even if God didn't incline them to do so. You're so internally inconsistent, dude. I don't know how you make a There's decision. There's no to inconsistency. On, there is none. And wait, you can wait. read this in Bignan's book. So, you can read this in Preciado's book, Helm's book. This is okay. not a trivial concept. This is a basic compatibilism. Quote, quote, okay, so I have another ability. question, John. So if God did not have to move on the heart of the man to do the rape, then what was the point of him moving on his heart to make him do it then? Because God wanted to intend the, the evil action for good in the same way he did in Genesis 50. But couldn't he God, use see, the God evil has good purposes. Good without moving on his heart to rape someone? Well, he could have if he had a different deterministic model. But we just believe that this was the way that he chose to do it. Okay. Okay, well, that still doesn't make sense to me because if the person was going to do it, whether or not God moved on his heart, then he wouldn't have to move on his heart to do it. But he, well, he wouldn't. He doesn't have to. We don't believe he has to. We just believe that in certain cases he does. We do you have a mouse in your pocket? And <laughs> see, uh, that has nothing to do with the topic. Okay, well then, so do you also agree with Kelvin? When he says it is foolish and frail to say that God permits evils, but he is indeed the author of them. Well, it, it depends on how you're taking uh, Calvin on that point. But Calvin also agreed that God was not the author of sin in the way that's typically understood. Uh, what he was saying there is that he's the author of it in the very specific sense that God has a purpose for the evil act to take place. In the right, same way that he did problem. in Genesis 50. Non-Calvinists, I probably even Arminians, all agree that God uses sinful things to accomplish greater good. We 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 agree with that. All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. No disagreement. The problem is, though, if you're saying that God moves on the hearts of men to do the evil, that's where I draw the line because I don't think it's necessary. God can yeah, I don't, without yeah. of it without having to determine the evil itself. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, uh, I'm I'm in agreement with you there. God doesn't have to do that. We just believe God has done that in our model. But why? Because we believe that that's the way that God is accomplishing uh, in an even greater purpose that's providential and, and all those things. Just like in Genesis 50, where he had a very specific purpose he wanted to accomplish in Joseph being sold into slavery, which was the preservation of a specific life. Right. But God did not determine or move on the hearts of Joseph's brother to make him. See, that's no. that's where we're disagreeing. Well, you would have to demonstrate from the text where God did that. It's not there. Well, we can talk about that, but I'm just talking about solely from the model. 
<laughs> Every time you pin Whether him down, that's what he said. Well, we can talk I, about that, but but I'm, I'm sniffing. Happy, over here. I am more than happy to get into that conversation. Yeah. I'm just simply saying, from Kevin, my view, that's how I'm understanding it. Which is what I, his question Kevin, I've tried was. I've approach with John before, where if compatibilism and determinism is true, then we should be able to see examples of it throughout the whole Bible. But what John, I've seen him do in the past, is he asserts the concept and then says, just because it isn't spelled out in every single story doesn't mean that it isn't there. So just because in the story where Joseph's brothers... What was that, brother? Did someone get cut off there? Yeah. Yeah, it was John. It was, I'm sorry, it was Josh. It was Josh. Yeah, uh, but I think he was saying, well, just because it's not there doesn't mean the, the concept's not an, an overarching thing. That's not even the point either. My, my point is, is simply from my view in terms of a theological perspective, regardless if it's true or not, you can set that aside. Just from my position, that's how I'm viewing it. So in this little frame, in this little picture, in this little portion of my perspective, there's no one that can argue with me. Gotcha, John. And that's not what I said. See, that th is this exactly, is why, this that is why is you will never have a exactly, coherent and directly, damn audio your, conversation oh, with the Calvinist because exactly you are what you said, John. vividly dishonest. That is completely what you said. In my not. perspective, where you lock it into your own little world, where you have this little thing, this slice of reality that belongs to you, there's no one that can argue with you. And everybody you have a fantastic imagination, wrong. Dustin. I can give you that one. You well, have a really can, fantastic can I ask imagination. you one more thing? The last time sure. you and I talked about this very topic, <clears throat> when we were talking about Acts chapter 4, I asked you... Do you believe that God determined the sinful thoughts and intentions of the hearts of the men that crucified Jesus? And you said no. But here tonight you are saying that you do believe that he moved on their hearts to do these evil things. So I, I just want to figure out which one do you actually believe or have you changed your Well, position? I don't necessarily believe moving on the hearts of men necessarily means you're determining their desires. Uh, but I'm, I don't even necessarily have a problem with God determining desires. I don't believe it personally, but I I wouldn't see a problem with that either, because I'm a compatibilist. Since well, actually, I, don't see I would argue you're here. not, because if so, determinism is the philosophy that everything has been determined by God, and if you're excluding the thoughts and intentions of, of the minds and hearts of men, then you don't believe in determinism. Well, and so I, therefore I, you couldn't be a compatibilist well, because no, you reject determinism. Um, that that would be more of a hard deterministic model. Right, but, but there's only one form of determinism, though. Determinism. See, that's where I, Kevin, I, I love you, brother. I just really wish you would read the literature here. That's just so not. John, true. okay, I have a question for uh, for you. So, if God, if He doesn't mess with the thoughts and the intentions, but He He determines the act, is a is a person like, okay, I don't want to rape this person, but I can't. I I just I can't stop. Is that is is that what happens, John? No, um, we believe God because, uh, determines through the their through the desires, and so they want to do it, and God uses their desires to accomplish that they do it. Well, that's an accomplice. No, that's a partaker. That's an accomplice, and by default, you are making God a, a guilty by just by making him an accomplice. Because God, He does not do that, and God, He will never tempt. Can, never tempt. Agree with that, but that's not. Amen. No, God, Amen. He will never tempt, and and that is using temp temptation. Well, you know what, John? It is, uh, but it ain't. But it is. I'm sorry. Praise go. Let me simplify it. So, are can you show us how God is not aiding someone in sinning, and how does that not make God an accomplice? Could you try to? Uh, uh, Explain that. Go ahead, John. Well, I would say that there's a conceptual difference between telling someone to sin, forcing someone to sin, and determining that someone <laughs> else would sin. Those are conceptually different things. 
So that's that's their that's their answer to the question. That's not Those an answer. Conceptual different that's, ideas. That's a word salad that I could go thirty different directions with any kind of interpretation oh, that winds up with you with a dog and some peanut butter and some weird hotel room. You not liking well, the answer doesn't it, make it, it not it, an answer. John, I don't understand way. how this doesn't make God a deceiver. Well, it, well, it depends on how you understand deceiving. Because there's senses in which we can say God is a deceiver. <laughs> because there's senses in which we can say God is a deceiver. <laughs> No, no, there oh, is yeah. no sense we can say he's a deceiver. No, God expressly says in Second Thessalonians that he sends a deluding spirit upon those who do not believe. Yes, that because they will say God's a deceiver, you jack dilly wop. No, that God, doesn't mean God is not a deceiver, liar. John. That's Hold Allah. On. Hold on. There's a difference between saying God is a liar and saying someone God is a deceiver. Those are different things. No, oh, it's not a deception. It's a lie. Someone you can cause someone to believe a lie without lying yourself. But John, you're you're missing step one though. Why did God send them a deceptive spirit? Is it because that's because what they, they did not believe? But that still is a deception. Yeah, but it's not God doing the deception. They chose that. I so know. God gave them that's what my they point. That's my point. So in that I, sense, I, you could say he's a, he's a deception. Okay, so okay. in the book of Corinthians, to that degree. in the book of Corinthians, when Paul was rebuking the Corinthians because they were being carnal. One says, I'm of Paul. One says, I'm of Christ. And he says, was Paul crucified for you? He commanded the Corinthians to be of one mind, right? Yeah. And that is inspired yeah. scripture, you would agree, I'm sure. So why was God determining right. them to be divided you, and then the at the same time commanding them to be of one mind? That's a double-minded God, is it not? Being of one mind in that text has nothing to do with agreeing on absolutely everything. What? So, God, if, so wait, wait, wait. So God doesn't want us to agree doctrinally? No. I, just that that text is not talking about that. If you go to Philippians two, uh, he's I, I, I'm actually. About Corinthians. Okay. Uh, well, the the being of humility of one mind. That's Philippians two. Thinking on one purpose. Philippians. No, no, two, no. Two. He says it in the book of Corinthians. He tells the Corinthians well, to it's be. It's the one same mind. idea. It's the same idea in both places, but it, it's talking about humility. It's talking about having the same mind of Christ, thinking in the same way that Christ did, being humble to one another and serving one another. It has nothing to do with eschatolo eschatological or any uh, secondary issue disagreement. I think well, the I Bible actually allows God, for that type of disagreement. I would say God can't be deceptive because he is holy. And if he is not holy, then he is not God. And then well, if you're worshiping a God that can't be saying, deceptive, that is not Yahweh. That's I would God. agree if by deceptive you mean lying. But if by deceptive but, you mean well, God, God that's causes the to lie. Is, God is here. Hey, hang on, hang on. A deception is a lie. You can't separate the two. No. Uh, yes. Because I have a God question. causes people to be deceived. That doesn't mean God is lying. John, I have a what is the definition of the word deceptive? Or deception to to cause someone to believe a lie. Correct. So a deception is a lie. That doesn't follow. To cause someone else to believe <laughs> a lie is not a lie itself. I have a I have, I have a I have a question. It's ridiculous. Listen, listen to Second Thessalonians two. It expressly says that God is causing people to believe a lie. You can say he has a good reason for it, but he is no, doing it says that. God tells, send people. them strong delusion because strong delusion. they reject yes. the truth, not because yes. God determined them to. They rejected the truth. Yes, they rejected the truth and thereby caused them to believe a lie. That just is no, deception, Kevin. Oh, dear God, this guy. No, it's not. 